If you have worked with state vectors before, you're probably familiar with the concept of the block sphere, where we can represent any one qubit state as a unit vector inside a 3D sphere. And this is a very useful representation because it allows us to map the evolution of the states through unitaries as rotations of that vector within the sphere. So what I want to do in this video is extend the concept of the block sphere to also include mixed states. Now I want to start with a refresher on the block sphere. So if you're very familiar with this concept, then you can go ahead and skip this part. But I just want to have a common nomenclature. So when we start talking about mixed states, we know what, what we're referring to. So let's start by looking at how do we arrive at this expression here that allows us to represent this state vector inside a block sphere. So for a one qubit state, we know that we can express any arbitrary state in the form alpha zero state zero plus alpha one state one, that's in the computational basis. And we know that this alphas are complex numbers. We also know that because our state has to be normalized, we have the condition that alpha zero norm squared plus alpha one norm squared must be equal to one. Now, if we want to express or represent the state using real values, well, we know that any complex number can be expressed in the form A plus IB, right? So we need two real values, A and B, to express each of these coefficients alpha zero, alpha one. That would mean that we would need a total of four real values to express this, this state. But we can also express this instead of using what is known as the rectangular representation, we can also use a polar form to express alpha. And that is given by some magnitude r and some phase phi. And we know that this r or r squared is the norm squared of alpha, which is given by a plus ib times a plus ib complex conjugate, which is equal to a squared plus b squared. We also know that this phi is equal to the arctangent of a and b. So that these two equations relate our polar form variables with our rectangular form variables. So this means that we can express alpha zero as the norm of alpha zero, right? So, so using this equation here, uh, this r, you know, r square is the norm squared of alpha. So here r is a norm of alpha e to the i phi zero. So this will be the angle associated with this, this complex variable. And alpha one is the norm of alpha one e to the i alpha one. And then we can use these two equations and replace them here in our definition of psi of our one qubit state, right? So then we can write psi equal to the norm of alpha zero e to the i phi zero state zero plus norm of alpha one e to the i phi one state one. Now here we still have our state vector represented in terms of four real variables, the norm of alpha zero, phi zero, the norm of alpha one and phi one. So we're still not better off than when we're representing this in rectangular form. However, this is where things start getting interesting. If we take our normalization condition, we see that because alpha zero norm squared and alpha one norm squared are real variables, well, we can then represent this in a diagram where we can say, okay, this x axis is alpha zero norm squared, and this one is alpha one norm squared. Well, then this represents a semicircle, right? Because their sum must always be equal to one. So that means that we can always express this two as some unit vector that is given by some angle theta. Now for reasons that will become obvious later, here we're gonna use theta over two instead of theta. And now by trigonometric identities, we know that this is identical to saying cosine squared of theta over two plus sine squared of theta over two, which is always equal to one, right? So now we have reduced the use of these two variables 
alpha zero norm squared and alpha one norm squared to just using this variable theta. And if we replace that in our state vector above, we have now that our expression is given by cosine of theta over two. So, so here we have norm of alpha zero, and we know that alpha zero squared is cosine squared, so alpha zero is gonna be just cosine uh, of e to the i phi zero, state zero, plus sine of theta over two, e to the i phi one of state one. Now, we can take this one step further and say, okay, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna factor out this phase of e to the i phi zero. And that's gonna give us the state e i phi zero multiplied by cosine of theta over two state zero plus sine of theta over two times, well, here we have e to the i phi one. Well, if we factor out phi zero, then we have to take it away from this, right? So we got to do e to the i phi one minus phi zero state one. Now, what's interesting here is that this prefactor of e to the i phi zero is what is known as the global phase, and it has no consequence on how we measure probabilities of this particular state, because if we take the, the norm square of it, it's just going to give us a value of one which means that we can now say that um, our state psi, and let's rename this, let's call this global phase gamma. Uh, so our state of psi is equal to cosine of theta over two state zero plus e to the i phi, and this phi is just simply this phi one minus phi zero, but I'm just gonna rename it to phi sine of theta over two, state one. And this is the same expression we had above, right? So now if we take a look at the, the block sphere, so let's draw the block sphere here, right? What we see is that any arbitrary state psi, it's given by this angle theta, which is basically the angle between our state and the z axis here. And then phi is the angle between our state and the x component in this xy plane. So we call this phi. So the reason why we use theta over two becomes obvious here. And is that, you know, if we take cosine of theta over two where theta is zero, then this cosine becomes one and this sine becomes zero. So our state zero is this point up here in the z axis. Now, if we take theta to be equal to pi, well, cosine of pi over two is zero and sine of pi over two is one, which means that our state vector will be pointing in this direction down here at the bottom, right? Our theta, when we take our value of theta all the way down to pi, that means our state one will be represented here, right? Because this prefactor with zero is zero, this prefactor with one is one. And then this factor of phi is the angle of the state in the xy plane, which is uh, from zero to two pi. So here we have that theta is between zero and pi, and phi goes from zero to two pi. So as we can see here, our vector for psi is always a unit vector. So it's always in the surface of the block sphere and all that determines its location are these two variables, theta and phi. Now, since it's always hard to visualize this, writing it down, uh, I created this application where we can see what uh, happens to the state vector when we change the variables, theta, phi, and gamma. So as we said, uh, if theta takes the value of zero, uh, then our state vector points in the plus x direction, and that's our state vector zero. Now, as we increase that value, we can see that um, the state vector rotates um, about the y-axis. And uh, when we get here to the x-axis, we have an equal superposition of state zero and state one, and that corresponds to a pi over two value. And if we keep going, 
you can see that once we get to a value of pi for theta, uh, we get to the state one, right? Now, let's go back to this equal superposition state. And if we now change phi, we can see that rotation uh, on the xy plane about the z-axis. And here, when it points to the y direction, we get the state uh, right, which is 1 over root 2, 0 plus 1 over root 2, i1. Now, the variable gamma, as we said, it has no impact on the overall probabilities of measuring 1 or 0. So, you know, changing it has no effect on the uh, location in the block sphere. So we can just see it as a um, pre-multiply for both variables and it can be visualized as changing the color of the state vector, which has no impact in, in where it's located within the block sphere. So now that we have reviewed the block sphere for uh, state vectors, let's generalize this concept for mixed states as well. So let's go ahead and now remind ourselves that the density matrix for a pure state rho is the outer product of the state with itself, right? So if we now take this definition we have here above, let's try to copy it, right? We can do this outer product by taking the cat version of this times the bra version of that. And what is the bra of this? Well, it's the same expression but we, we have to turn our kets to brass and take our, our amplitudes and make them into their complex conjugates. So here we would have e to the minus i gamma times cosine of theta over 2, the brow of 0, plus e to the minus i phi sine of theta over 2, the brow of 1. Right? And if we distribute this, well, the first thing to note is that this global phase for the density matrix immediately cancels out, right? Because when we multiply e to the i gamma with e to the minus i gamma, well, this is just e to the zero, which is equal to one. So those global phases cancel out. And then we have cosine squared of theta over two, zero, zero, right? Multiplying these two terms. Then we have plus cosine e to the minus i phi sine of theta over 2 and then we have 0 1 so here we multiply these two terms plus now we have e to the i phi sine of theta over 2 times cosine of theta over 2 and then we have 1 0 right so now we multiply these two terms plus sine squared of theta over 2, 1, 1. From multiplying these two terms. Okay, so, so here we have this expression for our density matrix, which can be also expressed in a matrix form as... Okay, now what we're going to do next is use some trigonometric identities to simplify this a bit. So the first identity is related to this term right here. So we know that uh, cosine squared of theta over 2 can be represented also as 1 half of 1 plus cosine of 2 times the angle. And the angle here is theta over 2. So this just becomes cosine of theta. The second identity is related here to the sine squared term. So here we know that sine squared of theta over 2 can be expressed as 1 half of 1 minus cosine of 2 theta over 2. And again, this is, this is cosine of theta, right? The twos cancel. The third identity that we're going to use is related to this multiplication between this cosine and sine terms so let's write it down here 3 is sine of theta over 2 times cosine of theta over 2 is equal to 1 half of sine of 2 theta over 2 and this is just sine of theta so let's write down you know 3 is related to this 
and let's write our fourth one is related to the exponential right here so four and this exponential here four so that identity is given by e to the plus minus i phi can be expressed as cosine of phi plus minus sine of phi. So now we can replace these four identities in our density matrix. And the first thing to note here is that every single one of the items in the matrix has, the, the, has this prefactor of one half. So we can just pull that out. So we have rho is equal to one half of, well, now let's replace one up here. We have one plus cosine of theta. Now in the bottom left, let's first replace three here. So three is sine of theta times, and let's replace four for this exponential, right? So we have, that's the one with the plus sign for the exponential, so times cosine of phi plus sine of phi. And then on the top right, well, let's replace first again what's related to 3 here. So the cosine of theta over 2 times cosine of theta over 2. So it's a sine of theta times, now let's replace 4 for the exponential, cosine of phi minus sine of phi. And then here in the bottom right, we have uh, replacing two, we have one minus cosine theta. And here we forgot to add the um, complex unit i with our sine terms. So here's all of them are i sine of phi. Okay, so the next step is to realize that when we have a vector in you know a three-dimensional space let's say this is x y and z right and we have our vector psi well we've represented it in terms of this angle theta and phi right but we have a relationship between Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates. So we've been using this polar variables theta and phi, but we know that in Cartesian, if we have uh, variables x, y, and z in polar form, they correspond to r sine of theta cosine of phi, r sine of theta sine of phi, and z is r cosine theta. So here we see some similarity between what we have in this density matrix and, and this relationship between Cartesian and polar coordinates, right? The difference is we're missing this, this r term. So if we, for example, take this cosine term and multiply by r, which is perfectly fine because we've been working with a pure state and we know that this norm of r is equal to 1, so it's just like multiplying by 1, right? We multiply this cosine by r, and then each of these sine theta, cosine phi, and sine theta, sine phi, again, multiply them by r. Then we can replace those terms by x, y, and z variables. So we can do now that rho is equal to 1 half of 1 plus, what is r cosine theta? That's z, right, plus z. What is sine of theta times cosine phi times r? Well, that is x, right? So we have x here. And then we have this plus i sine phi times sine of theta. So it will be plus i y. And then here on the bottom right, we have 1 minus z. And in the top right, we have r sine theta times cosine phi, so that's an x, and then minus i y. So we have moved now from polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates.
but they're perfectly equivalent. The only condition we have so far is that since we've been working with pure states, we have to realize that this x, y, and z terms are for when r is equal to 1. But this is where the interesting part is. If we now not let just the magnitude of r take a value equal to 1, which is the case for pure states, but if we let this magnitude of r take values between 0 and 1, then that allows us to represent mixed states. Now, another very interesting thing here is that if we start breaking this down into smaller pieces, so we can do the following. We could do rho is equal to 1 half times, and let's take here the identity matrix 1, 0, 0, 1, plus, now we can, we have pulled out this, this one from here, so we have z, x plus i, y, and then x minus i, y, and then minus z, right? We pulled out this ones from, from above, right? And this is the identity matrix now. And we can, we can keep going that way. We can do one half times, let's write it as identity matrix plus and now let's let's use this z lowercase z as a multiplier times the matrix one zero zero minus one and what is this this is the Pauli z matrix right plus and now we have zero zero and here we have x plus i y and x minus i y and we can keep going, one half of identity plus this pre-multiplier z times the Pauli matrix z, and now plus pre-multiplier lowercase x times the matrix 0, 1, 1, 0. But what is that matrix? That's the Pauli x matrix, and then plus 0, i, y, minus i, y, 0. And then finally, we have 1 half of identity plus a prefactor z times the z Pauli matrix plus a prefactor x times the x Pauli matrix plus a prefactor y times the y poly matrix, which is, is given by 0, i, minus i, 0. Right? So we can represent now this row as a sum of Pauli matrices and the identity with some prefactors x, y, and z. And this can also be written in the form of 1 half of the identity matrix plus some vector r dot product this vector of matrices let's call it p and this this vector r is a vector given by the components x y z and this vector p is just a group of the poly matrices x y and z so basically, this was just a long way of saying that any density matrix rho given by elements rho 0, 0, rho 1, 0, rho 0, 1, rho 1, 1, can be decomposed into the poly matrices and the identity matrix using some prefactors x, y, and z. And this, this vector r is what is known as the block vector and it represents our state in the block sphere, even for mixed states. But now this R doesn't have to have norm one. Its norm can take any value between zero and one. So the best thing to do now is to look at some examples on how is it that any density matrix, including those for mixed states, can be represented by this block vector in the block sphere. Now this block sphere, it's sometimes referred to as the block ball because now it not only has state vectors on the surface of, 
unit one, but it can also have state vectors inside the block sphere or inside this block ball. So let's take a look at some examples to get a better understanding of what this means. 